Welcome to the Equip Podcast. Here you'll find conversations from people of all different walks of life, sharing their experiences, the things the Lord has taught them, and things to equip you. Equip is based on Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, that talks about equipping God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That is our goal here, to build you up and equip you through seasons of ups and downs in life. All right, y'all, that, I mean, we could just go home after that. I'm done. And I, there's just, I love singing God's word and I love singing his praises back to him. And I love getting to do that a lot. Isn't this worship team fantastic? Can we give them a round of applause? They have been wonderful. And, um, and I love just um, getting to worship together as women. There's something really sweet about hearing each other's voices just here together in the room as women this morning. Um, and also, I just want to say thank you again to the team, to Debbie and to Taylor and the team here at Green Acres. Just, this has been incredible. And I'm so grateful to get to be a part. And I mean, just to get to meet so many of you. Um, this is just, I love getting together with women. It's one of my, truly is one of my favorite things. Um, this morning, we are gonna pick right back up in Colossians chapter three. Um, but as we talk about that, it's interesting. I, when, when my husband and I first started dating, um, I had, I was the girl who didn't, ever, didn't date in high school. I didn't date in college. And I was like, Lord, you've forgotten about me. Like you have just forgotten that I exist. Like, are you ever going to bring a man into my life? And I was like, what's wrong? Like, I would look at my friends. I'm like, what's wrong with me? They're like, nothing. And, um, you know, but then I would have the oh so sensitive people who would look at me and they're like, I don't understand why you're not married yet. And I'm like, I don't really know what kind of question that is or statement. I don't know what that says about me or about you, and I'm really not sure how to respond. Um, But um, I finally, in my early 30s, decided I would give online dating a try, and it worked, and praise the Lord for that. And, um, but when my husband and I started dating, we, um, you know, like, I think we knew really fast. Like, I was 32, he, or is that right? Maybe I was 33, I can't, I can't keep track anymore. And, um, but we, we dated for six months right before we got engaged. But sometime, you know, that summer, we started dating in um, February. And, like, we get to the summer, and I'm like, this is it. Like, this is gonna happen. This is awesome. I'm super pumped. But he hadn't yet told me that he loved me, and he also hadn't kissed me, which I was like, What's the hold out here, buddy? And, it, it, and let me just be perfectly honest. I work with teenage girls a lot and I like love, hate to tell them this. I'm like, I had never been kissed before. And it was not out of, I had not kissed dating goodbye. I did not decide to like not kiss anybody until I got married. I just had not yet had the opportunity. I was ready. I was ready for the opportunity. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm so like, like every time like he's saying goodbye, I'm like, goodbye. Is this it? Is this it? Like, and it just still wasn't. And I was like, what's going on? And, um, but when he sat me down, I think sometime in July and we're sitting in my, in my apartment, I remember like what I was wearing and like, I was not dressed up. I was just in like, you know, my casual Sunday afternoon wear. And, um, but we're sitting there talking and like, he kind of goes like really serious all of a sudden. And he starts telling me, like, he told me that he loved me and y'all, I died laughing. (laughs) Like he looks at me, he goes, Mary Margaret, I love you. And I'm like, I literally, like, I mean, and just went into like full-blown belly laughter for at least a minute. And, and he goes white as a ghost. And like what I realized while I'm laughing, like just overwhelmed with the fact that he has just told me that he loves me, is the fact that he now thinks I'm laughing at him. And like that I'm laughing at the fact that he has said that he, that he loves me. And so then, and I was like, that's not what I meant. Like, I, I, I love you too. And like, I just, but I could not recover in this moment. Like, but I'm realizing I've got to pull it together and recover so that we can like have the rest of this conversation and see where this is going and all this kind of stuff. And it just was like impossible in the moment. And he just completely shut down. And he looked at me, he goes, you're gonna have to give me just a minute. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, no, no. Like, this is, I'm so excited. And he was like, hold on. Like you you're literally are just going to have to give me a minute. And we sat there in silence, y'all, for multiple minutes. And I'm just like, like, I just didn't even know what to do with myself. But that's how I respond to, to good things. Like I, I laugh. Like my friend Molly, who's sitting over here, can tell you, like that is just my, when, when good things happen, also sometimes when bad or awkward things happen, I laugh, which is not a good situation. But this was a really good moment. And I think for the first time, like, I mean, I love my family. I love my friends. But for the first time, a man was looking at me going, I love you. And I, it just felt different. And it looked different. And I had to go, okay, what do I do with this now? Because this is new and it was wonderful. And y'all, he didn't even kiss me till the day we got engaged. And I thought, so I was like, some, I finally looked at him. I was like, are you ever going to kiss me? He was like, just wait, it's going to be good. And I'm like, 
for Pete's sake. And so then our first kiss is like in front of people because there were like people in the room taking pictures when he proposed. And I was like, but by that point, I did not give a rip that anybody else was in the room. It was all fine. But, but here's the thing. I understood that day in a totally new way what it meant to be dearly loved. And today, as we look at the rest of this passage, Paul, he launches off, you know, again, he is writing to the church at Colossae. He is in prison. He has never met these people, but he dearly loves them. He is saying, I I care about you. I care enough about you as brothers and sisters in Christ to tell you what's going on so that you can live the life that God has designed for you, that you can walk into the fullness of what it looks like to be obedient followers of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to miss that because I love you so much. Because of the depth of that love, I'm going to call you out, but I'm also going to encourage you, admonish you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you some tools. And that's what we're doing today. Last night, we talked about some hard things that we have to put to death. We have to get rid of. We have to completely leave our old self behind and say, no more. That's not who I am anymore. I don't go left anymore. I go right. I'm, I'm following Jesus and my life has to look different. And so when we pick up, In Colossians 3, verse 12, it says, therefore, and I love therefore in the Bible because here's the thing, you have to look backwards to go, what is it therefore? And so we already know what it's there for. He he has set us up really well. And he's saying, because of all of these things, because of what we now know, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also are to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so today what we're gonna be talking about is this big idea that putting on what Christ has freely given you changes your life and it brings you freedom. So putting on what Christ has freely given you, it'll change your life and it brings you freedom. When we take on what it is that he has given us, what it is that he has commanded us to take on, it completely changes everything. And and it gives us this new sense of freedom that only Christ can give us. You know, and I think sometimes we want to go, well, I'm free, YOLO, like, you're, you know, you're only going to live once, this is my life, I'm going to live my best life. Like, we say all these phrases, we say all these things that, that culture is telling us to say these days, and he's like, that's not what freedom looks like. That's not what it looks like to completely walk and live in the freedom that I have for you. And so today, as we look at this passage, we're going to see what it is that we're supposed to put on. So we're not standing here like half naked. You know, we put off all of these things and he is saying, clothe yourself with these new things. And so where it says, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, you know, we are, here's the thing we have to remember. We are dearly loved by God. More so than Jonathan can ever love me. God loves me immensely more than that. He loves you immensely more than that. More than anything we can understand this side of heaven. And he just says that we have, we belong to him. That he is saying, I have chosen you. I have, I have redeemed you. I have made you mine. You are, you are with me. We're doing this together forever. As long as you have a relationship with me, as long as you have chosen me, I have, I have already extended my hand towards you. I've already done that work. You know, we're chosen, and it it used to be, and this is a cultural change that's happening at the time. We have to think about this in the context where they were, is that the Israelites had been God's chosen people, that they were the ones that God had chosen, that he had said, hey, you are my chosen people. I am gonna rescue you out of Egypt. Here's what I'm gonna do with you. You are the ones that are mine and that I love. And now this invitation has been, because of what Jesus did on the cross, the invitation to to be one of God's is for everyone. You know, no longer is it just the Israelites that belong to God, but anyone who would, who would come after him, anyone who would choose him, he is saying, you are mine. That, that racial divide no longer divides us. It's not the same as it used to be. Because here's the thing, it's a privilege to be loved by God. Because at the end of the day, we are unworthy. The, the little bit that we bring to him does not, rede- we can't redeem ourselves from our sin. We can, there's nothing, no amount of goodness we could ever do that could ever cover up all the mistakes that we've made, the things that we've done. You can't work your way out of all of this. Jesus had to die on the cross so that we could have relationship with him. 
He, that blood had to be shed so that we could now know what it means to be saved, to be redeemed by him. And so I love that he is saying, you are mine. If you are in Christ, you, you're with me. You can't get out of this. Like we're in this together for the rest of time and eternity. And so we know now what we're supposed to put off, but do we know what we're supposed to put on? And some of these things are easier than others. Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Like I wish that I could say that I'm the most like empathetic kind person in a room, but I'm just not. Like, that's just the honest answer. Like, I, I'm pretty bossy, like when it really comes down to it, and I usually have a better idea. Anybody else feel me? Anybody else in here have a better idea of how to do things? Thank you for your honesty. Um, and, and so sometimes I'm just like, well, no, that's not the right way to do that. Like, we're going to do it this way. You know, and I'm like, I, I know what I'm doing here. Just trust me. And, and here's the thing is that he is saying, like, you have to put on compassion, Like, I am not the most compassionate human being there ever was. Like, when people tell me sad things, like my friend Molly, who's here with me, she's a counselor, and it's like, I want to go, go talk to Molly. I'm really sorry. You know, I'm like, I don't really know what to say past that. Like, and when I don't cry when other people cry. Like, you know, some of you, like, you, when you feel what other people feel, I don't. Like, I can laugh with you all day long, (laughs) but like when people start showing emotions, this is when that weird part of me that laughed when Jonathan told me he loved me that comes out and I'm like, so sorry. (laughs) Like my face does weird things and it's like my emotional wires get crossed and it's not that I don't want to be compassionate. It's just that like everything inside kind of goes sideways. And so like, I've really had to go, Lord, what does it look like for me to show compassion, to show empathy? to sit and to listen. And I may not be the one who can like actually cry tears, but, I, but I'm learning what it looks like to sit there and go, okay, let me just listen. Let me, let me see what this looks like to, um, to, to step in with you to what you're walking through and to be a good friend that way. Because I, if I wouldn't have any friends if I wasn't compassionate. And I think that that is, my, that is honestly my tendency that like I can kind of like run over people if I'm not careful. And so I've had to learn what it looks like to become a compassionate, gentle person. And it's only because of Christ that I can do those things. And that's when, if somebody will ever say that I am like, like I showed such compassion, I will go, that is Jesus. Like I'm fully aware that that's not my flesh. It's only by the cross of Christ and what he did that I'm able to respond that way. But he's saying, I want you to take on these things because these things make you look more like me. It also says bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against it against each other. And so we have to think about that too. Last night, I asked you that question. Like, is there, do you realize what you've been forgiven from? Is there anybody that you need to forgive? This idea of forgiveness is all throughout scripture. And I think sometimes we just want to go, well, that doesn't matter that much. And like not too long ago, my husband and I, like we're having some sort of an argument and like, I knew I was right. And um, (laughs) I mean, right. I just, I was like, I'm right on this. And I just looked, I said, I'm just waiting on you to apologize. And he was like, I don't think I need to apologize for anything. And I was like, well, we're at a crossroads, my friend, you know? And like, we kind of had to get down to the end of it. And he finally looked at me and he just said, Mary Margaret, I think you misunderstood me like earlier in our conversation, but he just said, hey, I wouldn't do that. I didn't say that. And like, I think that you're just having a, like, he was trying to call me out and saying I was being hormonal or emotional without saying it. And I knew what he was saying. But then I realized too, I was like, I kind of, I think I took it out of context. I think I heard it wrong. And I had to back off and just go, you know what? I don't think you owe me an apology. And I think I overreacted and um, we're just going to move on from here. But like, we've had to learn, you know, in friendships and marriage, like when I had roommates for years, I think I counted one time I had 14 different roommates throughout my life. It was a lot. And, um, and some were great. Molly was one of those. Some of them were great. Some of them not so great. Some of them were kind of weird. Um, and that's just like, y'all, my college roommate, she was into SpongeBob. And I was like, Lord, when I filled out this application about a roommate, I think the only thing we have in common is we like the room cold. And um, I'm just grateful she didn't want to turn on the heat. But um, anyway, it's like we, we find all these things that like we, especially with the people that we're with all the time, our closest friends, our family, the people that we just kind of show off our crazy flag to, and we're like, they see it waving way faster than anybody else does because they're, they're with us when we just kind of relax. And then that crazy flag kind of starts flying. And we're like, I wouldn't say or do this to anybody else, but right now, let me tell you. And um, right, like our crazy flag kind of starts flying sometimes. And we, Jesus is saying, that is not an excuse. 
you can't just choose to do those things because you feel like it and because you're just letting your feelings get ahead of you today or because you just know that you're right. He's saying you've got to rethink these things. We see all throughout Paul's letters, he uses these same kind of examples. And I think this scripture is going to be on the screen. Um, but in 2 Corinthians 6, 6, it says, by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. He gives us these lists all throughout scripture of things that we're supposed to do. Galatians 5.22, which is probably familiar to you, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Ephesians 4.2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Philippians 2.3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Paul, as he is writing these letters to the churches, here's the thing, what was common to them was not like, he was going, everybody's having the same issues. It just looks a little bit different all over the place. And I used to get to travel. And uh, when I worked for Lifeway in Nashville, I got to coordinate women's events all the time. And so I was behind the scenes, making sure everything was, was happening. All the details were taken care of um, at these women's events all over the country. And it was funny. We would be in places like Des Moines, Iowa, and they'd be like, our women, they just register late here. Our women, they just do this, this, and this. And I'm like, everybody, everywhere I go in the United States says the exact same thing. Like we would be in Atlanta and they were like, our women, they just are slow, slow to register for stuff. Like they just wait till the last minute. They do this. I'm like, yeah, so are the ladies in Des Moines, Iowa. Like they're doing the same thing. All of these things are common things that these believers are facing. The same is true for us today. Here, here's, the, here's the deal. Here we are 2000 years later. Are we still dealing with these same issues? Are we still having to put on the same stuff, put off the same stuff that they were? Yes, we are. Nothing has changed. God is still sovereign, but we are still a messed up people. And so as we look at this, we have to ask some questions of ourselves to go, what am I gonna do differently? How, what can I learn from what Paul is trying to encourage this church body to do? Like, how can I make a difference in the big picture? And so, you know, that question that I asked last night, when this passage starts to talk about forgiveness, um, it just says like, we have to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. That's easy. And here's the thing, it's not easy. Um, but until we understand the depth of what we've been forgiven, until we really take a deep look and go, let me think of all the stuff that God has forgiven me for, he's forgiven me of. When I think of all of that together, that's when then we have compassion to forgive others, when, even when it's hard. Because here's the deal, we have been forgiven of so much that we have no right to, to not forgive anybody else. We have been forgiven of everything you've ever done and will do if you are in Christ. And so who are we to withhold forgiveness from someone else? You know, it is not hard. I mean, wait, wait, hold on. It is not easy. <laughs> Let me get that word right. It's not easy. And I know that some of you are in, like, have been or are in very difficult situations where the last thing you wanna do is forgive somebody. You've been hurt really deeply, and you're, there's somebody that feels like that they are to blame. And there are circumstances that have been beyond your control. And the last thing you want to do is forgive. I would encourage you today to take a really deep look at what you've been forgiven. And just to say, God, help me to dig deep. Help me to better understand what I've been forgiven so that I can, like you did for me, extend that same forgiveness. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't make everything right. It doesn't unscramble any eggs that have been scrambled. It does not make anything, it doesn't change what happened, but it changes you, changes your heart, your perspective. And even if that, that our relationship has been severed, anything like that, then maybe you can't, maybe it's somebody that you can't physically have a conversation with or you're not gonna be able to have that conversation with to, to grant forgiveness. That doesn't mean that you don't do it. Even if you just get along with the Lord and say, you know what, I'm, I'm out of options here because this is absolutely about to bury me, the fact that I haven't forgiven this person. And so for some of you today, it's, it's very, this is not a light subject. This is not easy to do, but he is saying, when you understand the depth of what you've been forgiven, it totally changes how you forgive others and what that looks like. And so I wanna challenge you to think about what that looks like in your life. Have you ever encountered a difficult Christian? Mm hmm. Yep. There, I, I've worked on several church staffs, and like I told somebody not too long ago, I was like, some of the meanest people I ever know are in churches. 
you know? And like, and I'm like, that is just ungodly. Like, what are you doing? But here's the thing, we're all human. And some of the people in your churches don't even know Jesus. They don't even realize it yet. Like, there are people who are just acting out of their own will, doing their own thing, you know, and even some people under the name of Jesus that are trying to, like, talk about him, they have no idea what they're talking about. Or they're just in, they're just in some sin, and they can't see it, and they're not, they haven't taken that turn to follow Christ, or they have just, they're just acting out of their own will. And, like, there are some Christians who are crazy, like, and, and y'all, here's the thing, is that that is where, as sisters in Christ, we can't let that keep happening, we have got to come alongside one another and say, hey, I love you too much to like, and I'm gonna let you know that your crazy flag is flying. Like, and I, let's talk about what this looks like. Let me come alongside of you. Let's do this together. To, to not be afraid to call out sin like it is in a kind, compassionate, gentle way. Don't be mean about it. But just to say, what does this look like? You know, have you ever tried to like forgive somebody you really didn't wanna forgive? Have you ever tried to correct somebody that you're like, I'm not a confrontational person? Well, that's not an excuse. Because it says we're supposed to say those things to one another. We're supposed to hold one another accountable because we are a part of the same body. We're a part of the same whole. And one of the commentaries I was looking at said this. um, It said, Christ forgave us. And it gave three different ways that he forgave us. Number one is freely. Like he he didn't hesitate. He didn't delay. He forgave us freely. He forgave us entirely. Like he pardoned every single one of our offenses. And he, he he forgave us forever forever. And he did, and it said this, he did it so as to remember our sins no more and to treat us ever onward as if we had not sinned. So we should forgive an offending brother. And so all throughout scripture, it is telling us we have to forgive. We have to forgive. And so we have to choose to put that into action. Um, You know, it's not optional. It's not conditional. It's also not easy, but it's something we're called to. Um, You can't willfully withhold forgiveness from somebody because it has not been willfully withheld from you. We have to then, once we can get past that and we can forgive and let's let God bring some healing into those places, that's where we, he says, put on love. Put on the love of Christ. Um, and that is like, you really cannot love if you haven't forgiven. If you are withholding forgiveness from somebody, you're not showing love towards them. You have to forgive let that go and like pull an Elsa and just let it go. Like we talked about yesterday. Like you have to just sometimes go, I'm just gonna let this go and trust God with how he's gonna work this out. But it tells us in this passage that love unifies us. It leads us to peace. And that says that it's the perfect bond of unity. It's the thing that brings us together and it gives us the peace of Christ. And it says that that's where we are then called to be a part of one body. And like we have different church bodies that are represented here in this room today. I'm representing my church, the Grove Church in Orlando, Florida. You know, we are a part of different bodies of Christ, but it's saying all together, we are collectively the body of of Christ. We are one. And, And we have to remember what that means, like that we are a part of a body and that we have to function well to do whatever it is that God has called us to do. Um, I heard uh, Tim Keller say this quote years ago. He's a pastor in New York City. And he said, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. So like for somebody to know us and then not love us, that's not good. That's not what we want. He said, but to be fully known and truly loved, well, is a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. And so God, here's the thing, God knows us and he loves us. And that's how we should treat other believers, that we know them and because we know them, because they are in Christ, we love them. And other people, other people are difficult. There may be somebody like difficult sitting close by to you that she was like, let me sit with you today. And you're like, okay, that's cool. (laughs) You know, and you're texting your friend going, oh my gosh, she wants to sit at our table, y'all. Oh, like, I, we'll just leave that right there. But like, here's the thing. As sisters in Christ, we have to choose to love. We have to choose to offer that grace, that peace. We have to say, I am going to be like Christ. I'm gonna let the love of Christ overflow in me. And I'm gonna, because that sister may be going through something and she needs a friend and y'all, it's you. Here's the thing. Sometimes we wanna go, I'm gonna let somebody else deal with her. She's really, she's really cute. And I'm gonna let somebody else deal with her and her problems, but it's not me. And like, sometimes the Lord is like, nope, that's your assignment. She's yours. So don't, don't miss that. And because here's what happened. The Pharisees back in the, um, you know, when, when Paul is writing these letters, the Pharisees, they were the religious leaders of the day. They were the ones who knew everything about the Old Testament. They had all the answers. They made up all the laws. And here's the thing. They made up a whole lot of additional laws that were not even in scripture. 
They just made up a whole bunch of rules just to make up rules. It's kind of like we talked about last night. They had their own house rules. And they were saying, this is what, this is what you're supposed to do. You got to obey. You got to do the thing. And that's what it's like. And so when Jesus came on the scene, he completely overthrew and upset everything that they had been trying to do. And so they, they had become so self-righteous that they couldn't even see that they weren't even really being obedient to what God had called them to do. And I think sometimes that's where, that's where we end up or we know people who, who become so self-righteous in what they know about God and what, what they've experienced with him that they really aren't even following him whole, wholeheartedly anymore. They've just become, they, they have so much knowledge or so much experience and, like, and they're gonna tell you all about it. They love to tell you all about it. You know, and, and sometimes we become so much about ourselves that we forget Christ in the midst of it. We forget that he is the one that we have to focus on. He's the one we speak of. And like, we have to remember that we need him. You know, I had a friend who very often when she would start to pray, she would say, Jesus, we need you. You know, and I find myself praying that a good bit of just going, Jesus, I need you. I'm aware that I need you, that I need what you have to bring. And like, I cannot do any of this on my own. And so when we see that like he is, he is the peace, we're called to be one body, that he is tying all of these pieces together, we're going, this all has to come back to Jesus. And so when we put him in, a, in his right place, when we ascribe him where he is, like, and we say, you are at the right hand of the Father. You know, you are, you are seated, the battle is won. You know, you are doing your work like in heaven and we're here to accomplish our part here on earth. When we put him in his right place, that changes everything and we become more like him. He's readying us for eternity, for the kingdom that he has in store for us and for us to have the, the readiness to tell other people about how he's changed our lives and not just to chit chat with our friends at church about how good Jesus is because we, we need community, but we also have to go and tell. We have to be witnesses and uh, we have to be image bearers. We have to be the ones who are telling other people, let me tell you about Jesus or just let them see it in your life and go, what is different about her? You know, I wanna know. Like she has this indescribable piece that I can't quite figure out. Let that show and then ha- take the opportunity to tell other people who Jesus is and how he's changed your life. And so um, I think I even forgot to tell you, like number one was wear it well. That's, I got ahead of myself. But our point number one that we've been talking about is this idea of wearing well what it is that God has um, put, told us to put on. All of these things, we have to wear it really well and we have to own it and, and just decide. Like I remember a few years ago, those li- they were like, Headbands are in now, but there was like a season when girls were wearing like headbands across their forehead. And it, I was like out of college and I was like, I can't do that. I'm going to look really weird if I do that. And one of my friends said, she was like, if you just rock it, like nobody is going to question you. And I was like, huh, that's an interesting thought. I didn't do it. But, you know, it's, but I thought about it. You know, but I think that there are some times where I have to go, okay, this is just what I'm going to wear and I'm just going to rock it and I'm not gonna let anybody question me about it. Because here's the thing, who, who is it that walks into a room and goes, do I, like, do I look okay? Like, nobody is going, what kind of outfit is that? Hopefully. You know, but like, we're, if they are, you need some new friends. Um, if your friend is asking you that, or maybe she's being helpful, I'm not sure. You just have to decide that on your own. But we have to think of the fact that we, sometimes like, we are the ones questioning ourselves. Nobody else is questioning us. Nobody else is going, well, that looks strange. We're just, what we're, we're worried about it. So then we mention it to everybody sitting at our table. We're like, does this look okay? And like, that then now is not the right time to ask because you can't go home and change. You can't undo that, you know? And so it's like, just do it. Just do the thing, wear it really well, whatever that is. And so number two that we're talking about today um, is what are you called to? And we're gonna look at verses 15 and 16 to do this, but you're gonna wear your faith well when you know what you're called to. You know, when you know what it is that God is calling you to do out of obedience, what it is he wants you to do, how he wants to make you more like him. And so how do we know what we're called to? It tells us in scripture, it tells us we are called to be people of peace. And it says, and, and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body rule your hearts. Let peace rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We also see Paul give us that same idea in Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We are called to be obedient. We are called to obey, y'all. And I think sometimes we, we want to go, what, what is the thing that God has called me to? What is the role, the, 
the big long-term thing that he is calling me to do, but yet we're not paying attention to daily obedience. And he is saying, I want you to obey me today. And as you do that, I am building in you what it is that I'm calling you to do. And I will show you, but if you're not being obedient on a daily basis, if you're not looking for those opportunities where they are right in front of you, for the people that you encounter at the grocery store, for the other mom at school who, you know, you know you need to have a conversation with, for whatever it is that you may encounter, for the person who sits across from you at work that drives you crazy with the music that they listen to. You know, like, are we, are we aware of the daily obedience that God is calling us to? Are we doing what it is? Are we spending time with him every day? And it says our obedience in this passage, our obedience leads us to worship. If we're not being obedient, it becomes harder to worship. Yeah, we can sing some songs, we can raise our hands, we can engage. But here's the thing is that worship is so much more than the music that happens when we're all gathered together. Worship is our life. And our obedience leads us to live this worshipful lifestyle that then creates this opportunity for us to be aware of the presence of God all the time that we are, we are living our lives in such a way where, where we are actively worshiping him as we go throughout our day. That obedience drives us to worship. And it doesn't mean that we're driving, driven to like sing songs all day long. It might, it, I constantly have songs like rolling through my head all the time. Like people will say a phrase and I'm like, dun, 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 dun. like I just go like, and I think I've also decided that my next career can be like making up songs for toddlers because we just make up songs all day long at home. And um, But there is an amount of our obedience that leads us to be in this posture of worship, of going, I want to make everything about my day about who you are, Christ. I want to be so in tune with you that I know what to do. I know where to step. I know how how to treat the conversations that I'm going to encounter. You know, what does it look like for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly? Does it dwell in you richly? Do you feel like the word of Christ has become a part of who you are so that then you can recall it to mind at the right time? I'll never forget my, uh, my mom's mom. She, we called her Nini. She um, had late uh, end-of-life dementia. And it was one of those things, like, it's just such, that's such a mean disease. That was her doctor would say that all the time. He was like, this is just the meanest disease. And she was one of those who was just sharp as a tack. I mean, just could recall anything. She just was on top of everything all the time. She also like always wore a dress and heels and looked like a million bucks. Even like on Christmas morning, we're all like in our pajamas and she is like ready to go. And, um, you know, just the sweetest Southern woman. And I loved, I loved her so much. Um, but at the end of her life, when she couldn't remember our names and she couldn't remember, you know, things that had happened in our lives, all that kind of stuff, she could remember scripture and she could remember hymns. And, and it was one of those, I was like, whoa. You know, it just like took my, literally took my breath away to watch that those things, those truths were so ingrained into her heart and her soul that even when she couldn't remember anything else, she could remember those things. And it just did something to me to watch that take place. And I loved there, we sang that song, A Thousand Hallelujahs this morning. I I love the album that that song is on. And it says, there isn't time enough to sing of all you've done. Like we could spend eternity trying to do that. We, here's the thing, we are a singing people. Like he talks about that we're supposed to sing these things in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. He is saying, be people who sing your faith. Sing those things over your children. Sing those things as you gather together. I, one of my favorite things, my church, we sing the doxology together a lot. And oh gosh, y'all, it's so beautiful. And like, there's part of me that is like, okay, let's sing it together this morning. Do y'all wanna sing the doxology? For those of you who know it, okay. I'm gonna start singing, but I don't wanna like sing into the mic. Can y'all turn my mic off once we start singing if somebody is back there? Okay, thank you to my best friend. Um, I'll start us off, but if you know it, just sing. And if not, just take in what it says. You ready? Okay, y'all have to sing with me, okay? Do not leave me hanging here. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh, that was gorgeous. Y'all have beautiful voices. I love that. But we, here's the thing. We are a singing people. We have truths that we can literally sing to God wherever we are. That's one of the things I sing over Sam as I'm rocking him to sleep at night. 
I want those truths to be a part of who I am, of who he is. I want that to be spoken out loud. My family has a trip psalm that we say, we say Psalm 100 in the KJV because literally I'm like the fourth generation that does this. And so it's the King James. But we quote Psalm, when we get in the car on a plane to go on a trip, we quote, like my mom's like, have you said the trip psalm yet today? If she knows I'm on a trip, like I'm surprised she didn't text me yesterday. She probably will today and be like, make sure you say the trip psalm. And I, even if I'm by myself on a plane, I will sit there and quote this psalm. You know, and I will, like, we've got to let these things be ingrained in who we are. We've got to sing them back to the Lord. We've got to make, give him the glory for who he is. We have the opportunity to do that. Ephesians 5, 19 says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make melody to the Lord with your heart. We see throughout scripture, it tells us to sing. So many of the Psalms are songs. They were songs that David and these other writers wrote to glorify the Lord, to make much of his name, to express their groaning, their frustration, their fears. You know, that David was, he, there were a lot of things he was fearful of. If, you're look, if you look back in the Psalms, there's a lot of comfort we can find there. But these things are meant to be glorifying back to the Father and for us to be in this posture of worship. And it's one of those things that when we can sing together, There is something that unifies us of saying, this is who we are. This is what we believe. And I love that when we get to gather together and do that as a body. And I learned a few years ago what it looked like for the body to function the way it's supposed to. And it was when I broke my ankle. I um, was helping a friend. It was like not even an exciting injury. I slipped on some ice and fell and broke it in three places. And it was terrible and um, super painful, had to have surgery, all that kind of thing. Um, But I learned really quickly that when one part of my body was not doing what it was supposed to do, it affected the rest of my body. You know, like my shoulders would hurt, my hips would hurt. Like I had a hard time getting comfortable at night. And because one part of my body was not doing its job, the rest of my body had to compensate and was in pain. When you don't do your job, when you don't walk out your calling, when you're not obedient to these things, the rest of the body of Christ that you're a part of has to step in and care for that and and, and stand in place until you start doing your part again. And sometimes when we are a part of a body and we just show up and leave and we don't do that, the rest of the body is kind of aching because it's going, we've got to have some more people who are a part of this body doing what we're like functioning well in their role. And some of those roles are hidden and behind the scenes. Like there are a lot of things that we don't see that have to function in our lives. Like how often do you, unless you have a lung problem, do you really think about your lungs? Do we think about breathing in and out all day long? Not really. Like not unless you're running outside or you have asthma or you've got some like clinical issue going on. We don't think about the things that do their job all day long. We don't think about our digestive system until there's a problem. You know, we don't think about the work of our pancreas until we have diabetes. We don't think about all of these things because they're doing their job, but they may not be the pretty, outward, exciting parts of the body. Because here's the deal. Everybody loves to be like the hands and the feet and like the face. Like we want to be the outward parts that everybody else sees the way that they work. And it's like, you know what? It takes all those inside parts too. And it takes, I was telling our friend, the sound engineer, I was telling him this morning, I was like, nobody knows this. Like nobody notices what happens in that like little black area with the curtains around it until something goes wrong, right? Like there's a microphone goes out and everybody whips their head around and they're like, "What, what went wrong? But like when everything sounds really good, you kind of forget that somebody is making it all sound good, right? When you are not doing your part of the body, when you're not functioning the way that you're supposed to function, even if you don't really like your part, God is saying, I don't really care if you like your part. This is the part you've been given. You got to stand up and do it. You know, and don't worry about what it is. I just want you to be obedient to it. And because here's the thing, that's where we have to hold one another accountable and go, hey, if you're not, if you're just showing up at church, and you're not serving, you're not giving, you're not leading, you're not going, you're not being a part of the body, then like you're not doing your part and the rest of the body's hurting. So this is my challenge to you that tomorrow morning, if you're not yet serving someone in your church, go say, I'm ready. I'll, I'll go work with the toddlers. Lord, have mercy on my soul. Or like give me a middle school, a group of middle schoolers, whatever it may be. Or like, let me go greet at the doors. Like, how can I help? What can I do? I wanna serve. I wanna be a part. I wanna do my part well. And I think it also says here too, and we can't skip this part. There's this one little sentence and it says, and be thankful. We have to be thankful for where God has us, for what he's doing, for how he's working. And sometimes that is, it's really, when things are hard in life, it's hard to be thankful. And I remember a few years ago, I, um, my husband and I had a hard time. Um, we struggled with some infertility and had a hard time getting pregnant. I got pregnant and, um, and then suffered a miscarriage. 
And my mom is really wise. And, and for my whole adult life, she'll look at me like when things are tough or whatever, we're going through stuff. She'll just go, what can you be grateful for? And like that day, I remember she is sitting with me in the emergency room at the hospital. And she just said, Mary what, what can you be grateful for? And I looked at her, I said, absolutely nothing. Like I was mad. I was sad. It was like during COVID too. So I was like, I was like crying in a mask. And I was like, <laughs> you know, they were just, I was feeling all the things. And I was like, I have nothing right now to be grateful for. And like, do I know that that, like, did I know that that wasn't right in the moment? I did, but I could not, I was like, not digging deep right now. Not going to try to figure this out. Not going to try to think of anything I'm thankful for because I'm just really mad right now. I'm really sad right now. And she just looked at me. She said, okay. She said, I'm going to ask you again later today what you can be grateful for. And she asked me again later that day. I was like, I still don't know. Like, and I was just, I was mad. And like, I didn't want to be thankful. You know, I'd gotten so excited. We'd already told our families. And like, I'm like, now I got to go back and like, you know, undo all of this, untell everybody. And like, I go to the hospital, I go to the, um, see my OBGYN the next time. And the, like one of the nurses, God bless, I love nurses so much. But this girl had not looked at my chart. And she goes, so how's the baby? And I was like, I had a miscarriage. You know, and I just had to, to go, oh, and she, and oh, I just, I felt so bad for her. And I was not mad at her that day, but it was one of those, I was like, it just was reality that I was facing. And like, and she was like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's really okay. Like this was several months later. And so like, I, I was not upset at her whatsoever, but it was just one of those like tender spots that it hit. And here's the thing, I had to dig deep and find something I was grateful for. And sometimes we just need to make that a habit, that we need to make that question a habit of ours to say, what can I be thankful for? What can I be grateful for? In the midst of the hard, in the midst of the difficult, what can I be grateful for? Because it says that's a part of this command. It says, and be thankful. We have a lot to be thankful for, even when things are difficult. The last thing, and this is really quick that we're gonna talk about, it says, number three is whatever you do. The last verse in this passage says, um, whatever you do in word or deed and do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, whatever you do. So it's not just saying when you're at church, when it's convenient, when you want to, it is saying in every area of your life, whatever you do, we have to give thanks to the Father. We have to be obedient to him because here's the deal. It is a privilege to even be able to do this. It's a privilege to be called his, to have been made new by him. And we forget that sometimes. We just go, like, we just go through the motions, do the thing, especially if you've grown up in church, it's so easy just to go through the motions and do church and do, you know, love Jesus and do the thing, blah, blah, blah. Like, and you just get in the motions and you forget what it is that he has done for us how he's forgiven us, how he's changed us. Our hearts should truly overflow with gratitude to the Father because he has dearly loved us. He has chosen us. He has called us. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Eat that Chick-fil-A for the glory of God, whatever it may be. Y'all, I like anytime I'm in Texas, I'm like, I will eat Mexican food every meal, no matter what. Give me all the tacos, all the queso. I lived in Tennessee for, the, for a while and they call it cheese dip. It's, it's not cheese dip, it's queso. Like, I still don't understand that. Anyway, but like, what God, God loves, I, I think there's gonna be queso in heaven. Um, and it might be from Torchies. That's just so, so good. Um, back, to, back to Jesus. Um, John 14, 13 says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And he's saying, whatever, wherever, this is about my glory. This is about me. Because here's the thing, we have made our lives so often about us, about what we want to do, about all the good things we're going to do for God. And he is saying, I have written this story. It is not about you, but I am choosing to use you. And he tells us that if we don't do our part, the rocks will cry out. If we don't step up, be obedient, be listening, be ready. He is saying, I've got, I've got other tools in my tool belt. I'm, I, w- I would rather use you. I've created you in my image. But if need be, I will make the rocks cry out. You know, and I, I don't want to be the one that wasn't doing her part, that missed out on the opportunities that God had for me because I was so focused on me, and focused on myself and all the good things I could do for God. And he's like, no, no, this whole story, Jesus is the hero. And I think a lot of times we look at scripture and we want to, like, if we look like at a story like David and Goliath, we want to think 
that we are David in that story. But who, who is David really representing? Jesus. Jesus is the hero. And a lot of times, I think even in just good Sunday school moments in church, we have watched, we try to put ourselves in stories where we don't actually belong. And it's really Jesus who is the one who saves the day. He is the hero. He is the ultimate one that we are looking towards and looking forward to. And there are some things that are easy to do for the glory of God, and there are some things that are really hard. And this church at Colossae, they, their own sin, their pride, heresy that they, were, that they were preaching over one another, those things were getting in the way, and Paul is saying, no more. You've got to die to these things, put them to death, and put on who Christ has made you to be. Let your life be forever changed because of this. And so when you do those things, when you tithe to your church, when you give back financially, even when you're going, this doesn't make sense. And y'all, there was a season when like, I just wasn't, I was like in between things in life. I wasn't making a lot of money. And my like giving statement from church accidentally got sent to my parents' house and my mom opened it. I was like in my 20s. Like, and I, I was old enough where I'm like, I knew that this was something I needed to be doing, but I just wasn't because I was, I was like a poor seminary student, you know? And I was like, I don't have enough money to tithe. And um, my mom called me. Ooh. She was like, Mary Margaret, I actually opened a piece of your mail and I see that you've not been giving to your church. And so we're going to talk about this right now. And I was like, oh, whoa. Zing. And uh, we had a conversation about it and I have been giving to my church faithfully ever since. And... You know, but it's like sometimes somebody has to call us and get us in check. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, sovereign Lord, you sent that to my mom. Thanks. And all of that to say, there are some things that are easy for us to do. For some of you, you love working with those preschoolers on Sunday morning. That is your jam. It is not mine. A room full of tiny toddlers terrifies me. Um, but there are some things that are easy for us to do, but sometimes God is calling us into more. He's calling us to stretch out. And, and so many of you, it's funny because the, the book that I wrote a few years ago is about discipling teenage girls. And several of you have been like, oh, I don't have one of them in my life. And I looked at somebody last night, I was like, maybe you need one. And, and if you need one, I've got a friend named Meg who's in this room who would be more than happy to talk to you about connecting with some teen girls. You know, but like, here's the thing. Sometimes we've got to stretch outside of what our norm and our comfort is. And to, do, to be obedient, to do those things, to let these things be cultivated inside of us so that God can change us from the inside out and so that we are walking in step with him with everything we say and do. He has called you to obedience, my friends. He has called you to right living, to saying, I am no longer this woman, but this is who I am now. And I'm full steam ahead, ready for the glory of God to do what he's called me to do. Are you able to do everything in the name of Jesus or is there something in the way? Whatever that is that is standing in the way of you fully following after Jesus, I hope that today you lay that thing down, that you will give that to him and never pick it back up, that it will be done, that, for, that you will forgive that person today and just say, you know what? For my own sake, for my own relationship with God, I'm gonna choose to forgive. I'm gonna choose to look different. And so you've got to put on what God has given you and wear it and bear it really well. Let others see that you know Christ so don't let anything hold you back from doing what it is that God's called you to do. Because we are sisters, we've got to do this together. We are called to be one in Christ Jesus. And even if we represent, because we do represent so many churches, it's not a competition. You know, churches, we are meant to be unified. And so often it's easily divided. But he is saying, I want you to be one as the Father and I are one. We've got to do those things. We've got to uphold it well and say, Jesus, you're more important than all of this other stuff. And my prayer for you today is that there is something that you can take as an action step, something you need to do today as a result of what it is that God's word has said. And so I'm going to pray for us in that direction. Jesus, you are good and we need you. We confess this morning, Lord, that we do need you. We need your, your touch. We need your heart. We need your direction. Lord, we need that fellowship with you. We need that intimacy with you, God, that only you can bring and give us. God, I just pray you would draw us closer to yourself. You would draw us to your heart, God, and that everything about us would, would show thankfulness to you. God, that we would put on compassion, gentleness, kindness, these things that honor you and glorify you, Lord, so that the people around us know that there's something different about us. God, and that nothing about that would be cliche, but Lord, it would be who we are. Lord, I pray that, that Tyler, Texas, the East Texas, Lord, would be changed because so many women are going back today. Over 600 of us are going back to our homes, our lives, Lord, where things are, are just as messy as where we left them yesterday. 
but that our perspective would change. Our hearts would be changed. You would help us to handle whatever situations may come in a way that honors and glorifies you. You would draw us to yourself in a way that only you can, and we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Equip Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to be the first to know when a new episode drops. And follow us on social media to stay connected. We're at GABC underscore women. See you next time.